And of course, that's where Nebuchadnezzar has his first uh, dream. And uh, pretty amazing stuff there in chapter 2. But we left off last week talking about uh, Daniel and these three Hebrew boys. Or we can call all four of them four Hebrew boys because they boys. Um, I keep reading and rereading and um, I got several favorites that I, I follow pretty close. David Jeremiah is one of them. And um, there's a range of thoughts on how old they were and it sort of depends on which calendar you're using. And so 14 to 18, 14 to 16 is the range of these guys, well, particularly Daniel. Uh, the other three, not there's not as much information even on them. But uh, so there's these boys then are getting started in the uh, in this new town, and you know they were born country boys, and now they're going to the big city with all those pressures. And we were talking about how can God's people resist the pressures that squeeze us into conformity with the world in our day and we were considering Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 where it talks about conformers are people whose lives are controlled by pressure from without but transformers are people who whose lives are controlled from the inside and that's from the power that um, of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us and so Daniel and his three friends were certainly transformers. And that's the, the spiritual lesson for us uh, today, even today, is that how can we be transformers versus conformers? Because as we study uh, this book of Daniel, we're going to see just how transforming these, these guys were. And they just stuck with the stuff, right? They, they purposed in their hearts. Daniel was the leader. They made up their minds that they weren't going to defile themselves, that they were going to follow God's word, obey it, and trust God with the outcomes. And if we jump way forward, we find out how did that work out for Daniel. Pretty good. Pretty good. And so, um, always do the next right thing. <clears throat> Always do the next right thing. <clears throat> God used these boys to transform or change the lives and minds of powerful people. They were put into a position of influence. They had a sphere of influence now that was unequaled in, in the entire world. They were going to be in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Nebuchadnezzar has just conquered the known world. He's the most powerful guy on the planet at the time. And they're going to be serving with, with King Nebuchadnezzar. And God's going to use these boys to change lives and minds. They're powerful people. Now, whatever our sphere of influence is, is powerful in God's eyes. Because if our sphere of influence can influence someone to uh, get a closer walk with the Lord or get saved, then that's powerful. There's nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing more transforming than that. There's nothing more important than that. To do our jobs as light and salt, plant a seed, do some water, might even reap a harvest. Powerful people. And God got the glory for it all. Always God gets the glory for it all. All the trials and trouble that they endured, and yes, they, there will be, has been, and going to be, right? But through it all, they... So these boys had run up against a difficulty, and so the first step in dealing with this problem was to give themselves wholly to the Lord. They had made up their mind first. And so uh, they had a heart that loved the Lord. They had a heart that trusted the Lord. They had a heart that obeyed the Lord. And so they had no difficulty then in making good decisions. When we're sold out, they said they purposed in their heart, they wholly followed.
the Lord God. He's first. A heart that loves God, a heart that trusts the Lord, obeys the Lord, then has no difficulty then in making the right decisions. And then we will just trust God with the outcome. We'll trust God with the consequences. See, we are always short-sighted, right? In that, well, it won't matter just this one time to budge. It's just little, right? Well, the next time will be easier, right? And then before you know it, you're compromising. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. But look, look at what we were also considering what else they did to solve their problem in being transformers. They were gracious, they were courteous, they were humble, they were meek. Ashpenaz was especially friendly to um, Daniel and they were just being Christ-like, these four guys. You know, they were living the Christian life. And so they were in a position then that a person in leadership, they were in a position to ask him a favor. You're not going to get nowhere with with being ugly, mean spirited. You ain't going to draw no honey's honey bees with that. Be Christ-like, even to that person in the office that's a horse's rear. Especially be nice to that one. Heap coals on top of his head or her head. They were just being Christ-like. You know, Joseph had a similar experience in Genesis chapter 39 and 40. You know, when he was in prison. Proverbs, um, what does that say? 16, 7, I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing about history, John, is what does it cost to know? Nothing. What does it cost any of us to be nice, courtesy? It don't cost us nothing. And it, we get along better with our own self too, won't we? I mean, the, the very second that we cut up in bed at night, that very night, you're like, oh, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> right? And so now you've lost your joy, your peace, mm -hmm. because um, just couldn't stand it. Had to say it. Had to have the last word. And it usually don't ever work out. The high road is always the best road. Always. Always the best road. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. <clears throat> That's exactly what the Bible says. Heap, heap the coals on him. You know, Daniel didn't expect an unbelieving pagan Gentile uh, officer to obey the word of God or obey the law of Moses and uh, get himself into trouble with the king, Daniel just asked for a simple favor, just a simple request. And, you know, the official turned him down, but at least Daniel was in a position to ask it. At least he had that open door um, mentality so that he, and, and he did. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm just asking, don't let me defile myself. You know, I'm trying to do the right thing here. Just give me the test. Ten days out of three years. That's, that's not too much to ask. And when you've got favor, you're usually going to get that granted to you. You know, the benefit of the doubt. And so this is exactly what happened. Daniel would never ask such a thing if he wouldn't. Uh, there's a special relationship had been formed there. You know, the Hebrew midwives acted the same way, you know, wisely in Exodus chapter 1. The apostles in Acts chapter 4, Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2, all of these examples were, were, were examples of resisting the laws of man in order to obey the Lord. And in every instance, they were courteous, they were not troublemakers, they were meek, they were humble. And, you know, these, these boys, they didn't threaten nobody, they didn't say, well, if you don't do that, I'm going to tell this. Right? You know, they didn't stage a protest outside. You know, with their signs. Didn't burn no buildings down. Didn't see the law that way. That's just not the Christian way. It's not the Christian way. And uh, 
You know, we face our challenges and our trials with courage and humility and honesty, and we ask God for wisdom to understand it, for the strength to act, and the faith to trust Him with whatever the outcome is. And whatever that outcome is, He's already there. He's already there. The Bible plainly teaches us, and it's based on the authority of God's Word, not John Ed Smith's Word or my opinion. You do it God's way, it's going to work out. But it may be more long-term than short-term. Doing wrong because you want to get to a good thing later is never right. You don't do the wrong thing to do a right thing. That don't work. That's not biblical. So Daniel then asked that chief, uh, as Phinehas, not to let him defy himself. And so we've gone over uh, who he was. And uh, in verses 10 and 15, we saw that Daniel you know, took the stand. It was God's word versus the secular world. And you know, when Peter was told to quit doing what Jesus had told him to do, he said, he said what? I mean, when it came down to that point where man's word conflicted with God's word, what did Peter then do? Well, he took the stand then. He said, I, I can't quit. I hear what you're saying, but I can't quit. And of course, he got beaten for it. Huh? He got beaten for it. Let God take care of the consequences. There could be some short-term issues there, but at least you won't lay in bed awake at night beating yourself up and losing your joy and your peace and your happiness and contentment because that's a real bit in there. Mm -hmm. I just soon have the stripes. Really? Yeah. Because then, then we'll go away pretty quick. But what we've said, done, or failed to do is more difficult. So looking into the future, how did that work out for Daniel and these three boys? Pretty good. You know, suns rose and set, and years came and went. Kings were built up and flourished, and they fell, and changes swept over the entire empires of Asia. But Daniel, throughout his life, he maintained his power, he maintained his preeminence, and he maintained his influence. He didn't lose his testimony. You hear that? Daniel didn't lose his testimony. For a Christian, the worst thing that we can do is lose our testimony. Right. Really. It's the worst thing that we can do. You now have no more standing to invite someone to revival. You have no more standing to invite someone to Sunday school. Right? You have no more standing to witness to somebody if you, li if you lose your testimony. You've lost your power. You've lost your witness. You've, walked, you've lost your influence. Daniel's influence lives today. His influence lives today. He's dead, yet he speaks. I think of uh, Adrian Rogers. Dead as a wedge. Still hear him on the radio. Charles Stanley just recently passed. We'll be listening to him for years. He's dead, yet he lives. R.G. Lee, another one of my favorites. Long gone, but still live. In heaven today, Daniel and these three boys occupy a throne, spiritually speaking. And in his hand, he holds a scepter, and on his head, there's a diadem because of his influence. God said, well done, when he got there. Verse 16 starts sort of another section, I guess, here. And it says that the steward, the Melzar, <clears throat> and Melzar is more of a title than a name. Um, the Bible translates that as the steward. But <coughs> if we were there at that time, they would refer to him as the Melzar. All right. So this, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And so they did the test, right? Daniel was able to talk them in just 10 days. Legitimate, 
friendly for just 10 days out of three years. Now, that, what can go wrong? And so here's what I think happens. As Phinehas is the eunuch that's in charge of all this business, Melzar is in charge of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So why is it that we, uh, we know those three names more so than we knew their Hebrew names, but we call Daniel by his Hebrew name and not Belteshazzar. No, that's just funny. Eh? Okay, so he's, he's talked them into it, right? <clears throat> and um, so after 10 days, sure enough, they, they, looking, they looking fitter. Now, I, I believe that this is a miracle. Because you take away a protein-rich rich diet that's high in iron, and, I mean, just the food on the surface, you would expect it to look better with the kings. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they look better on the vegetables and the pulse. But I think that's a miracle. And pulse is a... Who's got pulse in their translation? I Both. Here's what's going on with that. A long time ago, when the original Hebrew was translated into Greek, I mean, how many Greek scholars probably worked on that? And so you got this Hebrew word, and Kevin, as a Greek scholar, and I said, well, I think that means this, and he translates it, beans. And then Kyle says, I think what the intention here is cereal and grains, so he translates it pulse. And so that's how you get there. Pulse, beans, vegetables, but pulse is a like a mixture of cereal grains and seeds. Now seeds will be high in protein. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on to talk about here, but I believe this is a miracle. This was Daniel's first test of faith. He took the stand, right? I'm not going to defile myself. And uh, we're going to try this. And it worked. And I think God honored that. That's, what I, that's, that's a personal opinion now. God was working behind the scenes. God working behind the scenes. Very well put. And it, it turns out that they looked a whole lot better. Their skin was better. Everything was better. And I think it was a miracle. And God honored Daniel's position that he took. Well, that's what I believe went on there. <clears throat> okay, so um, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and, and gave them, you know, did the switch. Okay, the original Hebrew here is has the idea of lifting and carrying away. Uh, so here's, here's another picture we need to get. All these guys... Uh, I'm drawing here. Daniel, the three boys, they're here. And there's fours of many others around. So they're saying, okay, um, we, we've got to take it to them. Otherwise, everybody else is going to catch on. Mm -hmm. And so this steward is working for these four. There's another steward here, another steward there, another steward there. If they don't do the ruse right, everybody else is going to catch on. All right, so why do you, what else do you think might be playing here? This males are. It's like, you know, we did this 10-day test, and sure enough, they... They look good. They looking better than these others. But I got to take them their meat and potatoes and their wine and stuff. So the way this is worded, it implies that he, he carries it in there to them. And all this back and to and back and to sets it down. And then it's carried away and replaced with the vegetables. And they do this every day for three years. What's going on with that portion? <laughs> they sell it out the back door. <laughs> sell it out the back door. 
I think what's going on is the males are got thinking, yeah, you know, they, they, there's no doubt they look better. And I got to keep up the ruse, but what about this meat and, I, and wine? He said, man, I can get me a sideline going there. That or he didn't have to buy groceries at home. <laughs> Bring me a bigger bag and tote it home with you. That could have been some of that going too. But either way, and, and if you think about it, they just about had to do that. Because what they got to keep up with this appearance. Otherwise, um, party could be up and then. Mm -hmm. you know? One of the things, if I'm selling it out the back door, how can I keep you quiet? Don't tell nobody where you get this from. What are we going to do? Maybe even homeless. They never going to tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's but when, when the other homeless start seeing that, they know he's good. You know, there's a thing there that whatever you're doing, if you're doing it out the back door, you got to keep the other group quiet. So that ball is getting bigger now. And you got four plates. Yeah. So according to the Hebrew scholars, and here's another one of them where I'm just going to confess up front, I ain't no Hebrew scholar either. I never confessed to be a Greek one, and I'll share it to a Hebrew one. What's need to <laughs> so uh, I just read a lot. And and they the, the Hebrew language here, they they say that this is constructed and it implies that the Melzar took advantage of this opportunity. And so these boys looked better, there was no danger there, gotta keep up the ruse, so I'll just sell that baby portion. I got me a sideline door. And this he did for Three years. <clears throat> um, just look at my notes here. Looking for a way out of the problem was not the right thing to do here. And this is another point I want to make about all this business. The question is, in some of our minds could be, what can I get out of this? Instead of, how can I get out of it? What can I get out of it, right? You know, you're in a mess, you're in a predicament, you're in a trial, and we say, you know, how can I get out of this? Maybe the more important question is, what can I get out of this? What can I learn? And so the Lord used this test to prepare Daniel for tests that's going to come into the future. Can we think of anything? If we've read the book of Daniel, them lions soon be coming. Right? Them lions soon be coming. <clears throat> Verse 17 says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding and visions and dreams. Okay. Um, Daniel was given a special gift. A special gift. A, a gift of being able to interpret dreams. The Bible tells us that Joseph had this ability. Right? When he was down in Egypt, he told the Pharaoh his dreams. Not only did it save his people, it saved the Egyptians too, because that famine got up in Egypt, right? He said there's going to be seven years of good, and then there's going to be seven years of bad, so you better store up. So Joseph had that ability. It was a divine gift. Do you think that God gives that gift to people today? Does anybody have a position on that? It's not a trick question. I personally don't believe he does, but there are others who believe that it's possible. So um, you might be in good company either way. 
I just take the position that we have God's full revelation now. God's gift given us this word. He's given us what he wanted us to have. The Bible itself tells us that if everything Jesus said was written down, it would be volumes and volumes and volumes, right? But but Jesus was particularly interested in us having what, what we do have. And I think there's a period right at the end of it. I don't think there's no need. No one has a gift of miracles today or a gift of healing. And I don't think anybody has a gift of uh, interpreting dreams. Do people have dreams? Yes, they do. I think all of us could say, yeah, I've had dreams, and they're crazy. Don't put no stock in that. You might have eat too much pizza and, and suffer from indigestion. So I'm just saying, that's just my personal opinion on it. Training and education are certainly important in our day, but they're not substitutes for um, a talent or a gift and the wisdom that only God can give. God has God gave Daniel a, a special gift. John, I think if you had someone like that today, I think the people would almost worship that joke. Oh, yeah. Would, uh, That's a good point. Believe in the word. He'd have a following, wouldn't he? Right. And, um, and if he was uh, truly an interpreter and a godly man, he would have no part of him following. But if he did want to follow him, that would nail him right off, wouldn't it? So, uh, so he, here's these four boys who had studied and applied themselves, but God gave them the skill to learn. He gave them their intelligence, and it was remarkable intelligence. They, he gave them uh, discernment ability to understand and wisdom to uh, to apply all that and, and to relate it to God's truth. And so as students, as Bible students, as God's disciples, um, God's students, all of us should ask uh, God for wisdom and then work hard to do our very best. I've often said that Christians ought to be the best students in class they get the A, do the best on their papers, they're the best workers at the job place. It's just a good testimony. It's a good witness. Do your best. <clears throat> just no substitute for Bible study. None. A fervent prayer life or doing every job you possibly can out here and serving. There's no substitute for Bible study. So these guys studied hard. They learned the Babylonian religion. They learned the astrology, the astronomy, and all the other sciences. And uh, they did understand it, but they didn't have to believe it. I fully understand the theory of evolution. I don't believe any of it, but I do fully understand it. And I have used it many times to help me in influence. The King's counselors had to have the ability to interpret dreams and um, and, and visions. Now God knew this, and God has put Daniel in this particular place, and God has given Daniel then this gift in verse 17. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Specifically pointed out, he had that gift. I don't know who I got this from, but in um, getting a secular education and being learned in this world, being a good student at a secular university, being a good employee, uh, being trained in the secular ways, doesn't mean you have to believe it. Here's a quote, and I, I did write down who, who I got this from, but it says, a chemist can handle poison to learn their qualities 
but be real careful about infecting his own blood with it. That's, I thought that was a pretty good quote. I've debated many atheists on evolutionary theory, and I've used uh, my training in uh, chemistry, biology, genetics, geology, physiology, all those hard sciences and all those debates. And so I understand the mindset of an evolutionist. I understand the theory of evolution. I don't believe a bit of it, but I, but I know it. Uh, and I understand that mindset. And so having that, though, helps me to show them the superiority of God's wisdom over theirs. And this is where Daniel and his three uh, friends are. They've been well trained in all this business. Now, at the end of these days, when the king said they should be brought, um, the chief of the eunuchs, Aphinehaz, brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so on the surface... Why do you think he's feeling at this point? The chief of the eunuchs there. When he's bringing them in before the king. Oh, so it's been three years now. I he bet you... See it. He, he's in How does he feel that the king is going to see it? Well, that's a good question. My speculation, and my gut would say, just from studying all this, is as Finahaz was not willing to take the risk of getting his head cut off. But Daniel had found favor with him, and I think he purposely looked the other way while Melzar did this 10-day test. That way, as Finahaz could be supportive, but if he got caught, he'd get his head cut off instead of mine. <laughs> So, I, but I think at the end of these three years, as Finna has, uh, has watched them, their diet has not changed, and they're, they're looking good, and they've learned all this science and literature to the nth degree. I mean, A students. They got a PhD degree in every one of those um, sciences. And as Finahaz is impressed, and he is giddy yeah. to get them before, because he wants some credit here that, you know, I've been helping on this now. You know, so he, he's looking for a gold chain or something hanging around the neck. All right, so, um, Daniel Williams given this special ability to interpret, and he, and he's, now about to get before the king. And so at the end of these days, the king had said they should be brought in. And so as Phinehas brings them in. So on the surface there, it would appear that uh, as Phinehas takes the initiative to bring them in, like, okay, your training is up. And so he is taking them in. But if you reread this, at the end of the days when the king had said they should be brought in, Nebuchadnezzar knows full well. And I think he's pretty excited about seeing these guys. And so Nebuchadnezzar initiates, okay, it's time to bring them in. They ain't going to get no extra time. You know, the, the testing is over now, and it's time. It's almost like the teacher said, time's up. Put your pencil down, and you want to answer about one more? No, it's, it's over. <laughs> I've had those time tests. I don't want uh, so it seems that as Finahaz then brings them in, but the original language um, is pretty clear that uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly when. So they appear, and Nebuchadnezzar is the one that summons them, and it's Nebuchadnezzar that's uh, the one that interviews them. And so we have to get this new picture here. Uh, these guys are now 18-ish years old. They're still teenagers. You know, they got there at age 14, 15. You add three, you're, they're 17 and 18. So this is a pretty awesome thing here. Um, they've been studying this Babylonian literature and language and science now for three years, and they've probably even never even met Nebuchadnezzar. You know, this terrible conqueror that just swept away the Egyptian army, just overthrew the fierce Assyrian army, those mean guys. The Assyrians were noted for how mean they were. They would skin people alive if they were so mean. 
That's why Jonah didn't want to go there. <laughs> and these people are mean. Here's this guy then that uh, they've never met. He, he's, he's ruler of the entire known world now. And he's overthrown the Egyptians. He's overthrown the, the Assyrians. And he's taken these guys into captivity. And now they're in, and they were forced to learn um, all this new stuff, given new names. I mean, they, he totally wanted to transform them into a Chaldean. I mean, it didn't take, but that was the purpose. Learned it all, but they didn't believe any of it. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man on the planet at this time. He had the power to cut their heads off. He had the power to make them slaves. And he had the power to promote them. Depending on the outcome of this interview. And they was prepared. They was prepared. Ain't nothing like being prepared. going to school, you need to be prepared. You're going to work, you need to be prepared. Studied up, prayed up, whatever, you need to be prepared. That's just good. That's just good Christian witness there now. Student on the play field, if you're playing shortstop for the Walkerville Baptist softball team, you'd be the best shortstop out there. <laughs> you just be prepared. Depending on this interview, cut the head off, slave, or promotion. Now, these guys were prepared. Verse 19 says that Nebuchadnezzar interviews them and talks with them. Now, um, my Bible says interviewed. Other translations just as good says talked. Which who's got something? Who's got talked? Talked, okay. That's just as good a translation. So it's 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 like a back and forth conversation. I mean it's an interview, but it's more like a friendly conversation. I mean Nebuchadnezzar knows what he's doing. He don't want to Russian. He wants them to succeed. He's got them there for a purpose. He's hoping that they're good, right? And so I think the the picture here is that it's a back and forth conversation so that it's comfortable. Mine's right? got communion. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. There, as you're talking about. Sit down, let's talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Be, be easy. Yeah. And I'm sure they talked about a lot of stuff, didn't they? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar ain't no fool. He's learned it as well. He's learned it as well. Just jot down some things that I think maybe how, how, how it might have went. We know that Nebuchadnezzar had great reverence for his religion, right? His occult. His magic. And he put a lot of stock in all that. We can sure assume they talked at length about that. And I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar asked them questions in all three of the languages. Remember, we established the fact that it wasn't just one language they had to learn. They had to learn Aramaic, um, Assyrian, and Akkadian. And so... I'm sure he might have asked him a question in concerning commerce or diplomacy in, in Aramaic. It's also interesting, and we get to, um, I think, at verse 4 or 5, or verse 4 in chapter 2, Daniel switches from Hebrew to Aramaic when he's writing his book. Why wouldn't he? Why couldn't he? He learned the language. Mm -hmm. So a lot of critics were saying, well, he wouldn't have known the Aramaic, but he clearly says they talk to him. Critics. So I'm sure they uh, ask questions in Aramaic. I mean, you could just imagine you're 
you're English speaking, right? And you go into an interview and you're supposed to be fluent in Spanish. And the first question he asks is, is a difficult Spanish language question. You better be prepared, right? So he probably asked questions about history in Assyrian. Diplomacy in Aramaic, history in Assyrian, and you can bet he asked all kinds of sacred religious questions in the Akkadian language. He probably asked them for, what's the magic formula for turning a frog into a prince? He knew it all. He might even said, what's the formula for my favorite barbecue sauce? They knew it all. It's absolutely possible in doing some background reading that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was pretty fluid in the Egyptian language. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't ask a question in Egyptian and Daniel answered it in Egyptian. His wife, say again? Jeff. Well, I think that's sort of like the next level. Like, I'm okay with answering all this, but if you can do that, I mean, I'm gonna be really impressed, right? And so I think, that's, I'm speculating, it's just background reading about Nebuchadnezzar's past and where he come from, but he was fluent in Egyptian. And so I bet you he asked an Egyptian question. His wife was a Mede, and I bet you he knew that language too. And I bet you that he asked Daniel a question in the, in the Persian Median language. Daniel probably answered it. I'm sure he asked a lot about a lot of things, but at the end of this interview, this conversation, this communion that they had, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. He was really impressed. Look at what he said. <coughs> Ain't nobody like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They ten times. So the law in there. Oh yeah. yeah. The law in there. It was all in there. And these fours. Yeah. They ten times. Now, there's speculation about that phrase, uh, the ten times. It, in my mind, is the language is like. There's an exaggeration in that. Man, they're just head and shoulders better. They're a lot better. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a a term that would capture Nebuchadnezzar's attitude. Man, they, they ten times better. He was impressed. He was impressed. So these young men then were allowed to serve before the king. So what does that mean? They were good enough. They were smart enough to be in Nebuchadnezzar's circle. They were personal advisors to the king, the most powerful man on the planet Earth. It would be synonymous with being a personal advisor to the president of the United States. When you sit in that chair, you are the most powerful person on the planet. And so to be in the president's circle, I wasn't going to go down that road. We're talking in generics here. Generically speaking. He's about as generic as we've ever had. I understand. I knew she took the last one. Well, he's not the president. He ain't mine. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but he is. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Personal advisor to the king. I mean, they're in his loop. They are going to be seeing him every day. They are going to be asked questions by Nebuchadnezzar about all kinds of matters. They're personal advisors. 18 years old. That's impressive. That's impressive. 
when you get to this point, it's hard not to take the position that these guys were a genius. In three years, learn what they've learned. Genius. Ten times better than all the rest of them. But all of these boys, all, I'm talking about all of them, they're all young, right? Yeah. Am I under, yeah. Am I understand that right? That they're all young. So they got them at a young age so we can train them more like what we want. And to be around for a long time, too. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Daniel was around 83 years at least. Mm -hmm. So they're admitted now to the royal group. They are rubbing shoulders now with the magicians. They're rubbing shoulders now with the astrologers. The old, old. <laughs> the old scholars. Yeah. They in the club. They in the club, but they not of the club. They right in the middle of it, Kyle. Right. You don't get no more in the world than that. Mm -hmm. That's right. But they weren't of it. So well, it keeps. Know, it's, it, it's kind of strange. Why would him, Ebenezer or whatever his name is, why would he listen to these young guys? Which I understand they're very smart, they're very educated, but you would think. You know, just like, it, it, why, why these young boys could tell this king? They were smart enough to be there, but the testing would still come, right? Mm -hmm. They were smart enough to be there. The king wanted the smartest people around him. Now, that's just plain smart to do that. Any good football coach will tell you, you surround yourself with good people. That's because Nate uh, Saban would tell you that right off the bat. He has surrounded himself with smart people. Now, into the future, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, like, you know, these guys work out. They're going to have a place here for a long, long time. If not, I'll cut their heads off. But at least they're smart enough to be here. Right? They're smart enough to be here. Listen, if you're sitting on the bench, bench in the NFL, you're good. Yeah, you good. So you better be ready to step in if the guy breaks his leg, you know. <laughs> so they had arrived. They, they were they were in the circle. They were just as in the world as anybody could be, but they're they're not of it, and uh, they, and they've done it God's way. Uh, that's a point I wanted to declare that I made. They've done it God's way, and God promoted them in this business, in this world. They did it God's way. You ain't got to do hook and crook. It may seem that might be the best strategy, but it's not. It never is. The other guy might get the promotion to start with. But in the end, you do it right. And you'll have influence. You do it God's way. You'll have a testimony. Now, at first, they're going to be subordinate to the elders. No problem there. We know that to be true because when we start in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, right? And he calls his uppers, you know, the gray beards like John. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> you know, those that's been around a long time, he calls him first. I mean, Daniel's not there to start with. Daniel finds out they after him to cut his head off and he wasn't even at the meeting because he was a subordinate. He was not allowed to be in on that first dream. So he, they're in a subordinate role. They're in the loop, but they're in a subordinate role. But we're going to see that they become the go-to guys real quick. All right? Verse 20 said they were 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that was already in his realm. So revisit that phrase again. What he is talking about here is Nebuchadnezzar had advisors, magicians, astrologers, the enchanters, the diviners, all those, 
and some of those were gray, gray beards. I mean, like Kevin. And then boys were getting quiet and they weren't quite sure about them yet, were they? That's right. That's right. And that's going to come back too. We'll revisit that concept. But Nebuchadnezzar said they they ten times better than gray beards I got. Mm -hmm. As far as just playing smart. Man, Nebuchadnezzar's impressed now. He's impressed. The magicians, or those that dealt in the occult, you know, the hidden things, the mysterious things, the enchanters, those that use the incantations or the, the gibberish, sorcerers, those were the spell casters. You know, I'll turn you into a frog. <laughs> The astrologers that studied the heavenly bodies and they were convinced that the stars is what influenced people and events. And you know, all that business started at the Tower of Babel. The diviners who were able, supposedly able to see future events. And now uh, here's Daniel and these three boys and they've learned all this. And my next note said, and this was strictly forbidden by the Mosaic Law. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 13. Strictly forbade, forbade that. But they were learning and all of it. So one more time, I want to point out, they just didn't believe it. They knew it, but it didn't influence them. In my own personal experience, I know evolution theory, but it don't influence me. I use it to my advantage. We've got to live in it, but we ain't got to be of it. Verse 21 says that God gave Daniel a long life. We don't know exactly how long he lived. We're reasonably sure that he was 83 when he received the revelations recorded in chapters 10 and 12. We also know that he was born approximately 620 BC. He was approximately 15 when he was taken. 605 BC he prophesied that the captivity or the judgment would last 70 years and he lived long enough to see the completion of that because in the first year of King Cyrus like verse 21 says here is when he King Cyrus allowed the Jews about 42,000 of them to go back to Jerusalem and to go back to the temple so we know he had to be at least 83 years old then so how long he lived after that, we really don't know, nor is it important. But here's a man that was greatly used of God. He mourned for the sins of his people, and he was one of the first that was taken captive, and he is now allowed, according to this verse 21, to see the judgment end and the people allowed to return to their city and to the temple. Daniel served under four kings. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Belshazzar and Cyrus because he maintained his influence. He maintained his testimony and he was able to influence world empires. What an influence. What an influence. We can have the same kind of influence. We can have the same kind of influence the events in these chapters should be a great encouragement to us because we too experience problems and trials and we got to learn to live in this secular world but not to be of it. Godly men and women are needed in places of authority, in places of influence. Fear not. God will see to it that you are prepared if you're appointed. Fear not. He will keep us alert until our work is done. Fear not because our God who called us will equip us. And he will cause us to continue until the assignment is completed. Because he who calls us is faithful. And he was faithful to Daniel for 83 plus years. We are either going to be conformers or we're going to be transformers. We're either going to be squeezed into the world's mold or we're going to transform the minds of people in our sphere of influence. Conformers or transformers. And that's what these three boy, four boys were. They were certainly 
transformers. And God can use us to influence the others who are in our sphere of influence. Now you think about this. i got two minutes. In Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Jesus had been born and the Magi, the wise men from the east, came to, to Jerusalem, to the area where King Herod was on the throne, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And the Bible says that when Herod heard this, he was troubled. He got upset. And when King Herod got upset, everybody got upset. The Bible plainly says Herod got upset and all Jerusalem with him. <laughs> because he was, he was notorious, right? These magi, these wise men, came from the Far East. And they knew that a king was going to be born. And they saw the star. By the time Daniel left or died out, his influence had become so great that they knew that a king was going to be born. And they came looking for him to worship him. That's influence. And we can have the same influence if we'll just do it God's way, if we'll love him first, obey his word, and trust him, and always do the next right thing, we will have influence. Lord God, thank you for this class. And I thank you for their...